We are back on Real Talk with Rashini. Our cornucopia Sunday of amazing leaders continues with my next guest. She is the president of the University of Minnesota. She is Joan Gable. And President Gable, so much has changed in the time that you took the <laughs> helm at the U. I mean, where do we even begin? Where would you like to begin? That's my gift to you. You start where you want to start today. Oh, my gosh. I that's a, that is sort of the question of the day. But since it's still the Thanksgiving season, I guess I'll start with gratefulness and appreciation because as crazy as these times are, you know, I haven't lived here very long and I have felt great appreciation for how wonderful this community is. And we got to see it in all of its facets over these last crazy months. And I'm here to tell you it's a pretty great place. Well, we think so. And we obviously appreciate how much you have really taken to Minnesota, the the whole university system, as well as the state. What are some things, because you aren't from Minnesota, but you have really made it your home. What are some things that you've noticed in now more than a year in the president's position that maybe Minnesotans need to be reminded about? Because, you know, frankly, it is that time to count our blessings. That's a good question. Let's think about this. So I think just starting, of course, with the university itself, that uh, the university was right at the front of a lot of the things that have made our ability to come out of the pandemic possible. And not just us, uh, lots of universities around the country, I mean, literally all of the vaccine tests and pharmaceutical tests have all happened in universities through the research that our faculty do and through the work that our students do to support it. And so I think sometimes people wonder what it means to have a research university of our caliber in the community. And they know it if they go see a doctor or they know it if they use an invention from one of our faculty or engineers or students. But the backroom research is sometimes a mystery, and we got to see what that really means in these last few months. So I think it's nice to know we have a university like this here and really proud of the faculty and students and what they've done to be part of the solution. But I also think one of the things we've always appreciated here and one of the things my husband and I really like about living here is how beautiful it is. And aren't we lucky that we live in a place where we all want to be outside, even with what everyone worries about with the weather, that when we can't be um, inside because it, suddenly it's dangerous that we're in a place where, it, gosh, it's gorgeous here. <laughs> and uh, and so my family, you know, who most of whom live down south, not everybody, but most of whom live down south worry about, you know, what, what will you do in the winter? And I said, the winter doesn't stop anything here. You know, we get right outside. I mean, if you were going to be stopped for winter, what would you do for half of the year? So grateful to live in a beautiful place where it's safer to be outside and we want to be. And then I also think that you know, we, we laugh at ourselves around what Minnesota nice means. Um, and um, I, I think I get the joke, not having lived here very long. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of nice, the real, real nice here. When people need it, when people need to step up and volunteer and be in service, this is that kind of place. And we did all need it. And it was apparent everywhere we looked. So lots, I think, to be grateful for here. Well, it's great hearing it from you, and you've really been able to visit all parts of the state and really remind us about the things that Minnesotans do and that the U is doing. Give us an update. I know student life has been drastically affected, campus life as well as just how your professors teach, but what should the community know about what's happening right now at the U? So uh, our students are now 100% um, online. Um, when they return to their studies after the Thanksgiving break, it will all be remote with just a couple of very, very narrow exceptions. And we planned that actually over the summer because one of the things we knew even back then, even though we know so much more today, is that traveling disrupts the ecosystem. And, you know, of course, we're hearing this now with all the warnings against travel. So we didn't want students traveling and coming back. And so our students who went home, we're encouraging them to stay home. And many of our students far more than usual stayed on or around campus because of the instructions not to travel. So they're not in class anymore. Um, and they really did an amazing job through the semester 
the numbers of cases on campus were way below um, what you saw in similar campuses all around us and remain low relative to the rest of the community. So they listened to the instructions and for the most part followed them. Um, they're human like many of us, um, but the case spread on campus was extremely low and we're very grateful because it could have been, we wanted to be positive contributors to the community and I believe that we were. Um, but the research continues. Um, our faculty have been in the labs the whole time with all kinds of safety precautions. So they continue to do their own research, much of which is focused on the pandemic. And um, the campus is open, but in the very modified way that we need to be now with the governor's new orders and with the fact that the students aren't around physically. Well, and it's it's good to know just sort of you're really being thoughtful about these decisions. I mean, the U is in the media, whether it's print or radio or TV, pretty much on a regular basis. But these are the kinds of questions that, you know, families do want to know. Another thing that was a really big bummer was uh, the first time in a long, long time, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin did not get to play their big game. What can you tell us about football? Well, that's hugely disappointing to everybody, all of the fans, but also the players and the, um, the team and the staff and all of us. So um, we have very, very strict protocols in the Big Ten, arguably the most strict conference in the country. And everyone who tracked that at the time knows that's because the Big Ten originally was going to postpone play um, and then um, decided based on very um, informed medical advice that there were ways to play safely. Um, and so we resumed with a modified schedule about six weeks later. But that play safely means that if you have cases, um, we have protocols that we have to follow. And if they reach a certain level, we pause practice. And if we're not practicing, we don't play because it's not safe for the for different reasons, injury related reasons for students to take the field if they haven't had sufficient practice and kept their bodies at the level that they need to be. So we reached that level. And so we paused play when we uh, no longer are at that level. We'll resume um, there. Are, it's happening everywhere. It's happened in the Big Ten um, and um, certainly in other games and conferences around the country. And while it's not a great thing that we have cases uh, within the team, it, what it, in a way, it's good news in the sense that we are, we promised we would put safety first and we are. And you can see it in how we've handled the schedule. So it's very possible that we won't see another football game this season. Or do we just oh, wait week to week? Yeah, it's all week to week. Um, I really, I, that I can't predict because if I knew exactly how many cases we would have within the team, boy, I, that would be a heck of a thing to have a crystal ball for. But you know, it's very possible that we will resume play. I mean, it's our expectation that we would resume play, but we won't know that until the cases hit the right level. All right. Well, we shall stay tuned to that because that is definitely something that people are very interested in. What about men's and women's basketball, hockey, men's and women's hockey? What else can you tell us about those sports? We are talking with President Joan Gable of the U of M. If you have any questions for her, give us a call or a text 651-989-9226. We're talking with President Joan Gable of the U of M. If you have any questions for her, give us a call or a text 651-989-9226. So those teams are playing um, and playing well, and uh, uh, they are also following related protocols you know, that work a little bit differently because, of course, their competition is different and they're indoors and a variety of other things. We don't have any fans in the stands because we're complying with the governor's order, um, but the play is up and running and off to a great start. President Gable, what can you tell us about the new year? So what will things look like for students, for faculty, when things get back, I mean, from the holiday break, or do you really have to wait and see where we're at at that point? So it's a little of both. So there are some things we're waiting to decide until right up to the moment. And even though that's frustrating because boy, if there's anything people want right now, it's a little bit of certainty. The fact is that the information changes really fast, even now, um, even with all we've learned. And so we want to make informed decisions that make sense. So if we made a decision 
based on the information now and everybody made their plans and then times changed and it was either safer or maybe even less safe, uh, and it makes it much harder for us to respond. So for now, what we do know is that we'll have the, what we call mixed modality like we did in the fall where faculty summer teaching in person following the six feet of distancing and masking or hygiene requirements. Some will teach hybrid, meaning partially online and partially in person, and some will teach 100% online. So that mixed modality will return in the spring. The semester begins and ends at the time it was always scheduled to. We did move spring break about a month um, later so that we would, first of all, line up spring break with K-12 through for this year to help our families, our staff and faculty who have children. It's been quite a thing for them, just like everybody else, to balance that. But also, the longer we wait before we send students um, largely away, if that's their choice to travel, the more we will know about how or whether we can safely bring them back. Um, but the circumstances on campus when we start the semester, we'll need to be a little closer to the actual start date to see what that means in terms of restrictions or other uh, changes we might have to make. Now, I know you have college students who are your own children. What is it like for the students? I mean, it, it just seems like they, their lives have been completely upended, getting not what most of us remember as an undergraduate experience. That is so true, Rashini. So, and I'll say, and I think um, I've talked about this a lot. I mean, my own youngest is a freshman in college, too. So I see this from this kind of aggregated way. You know, we have thousands of freshmen, but I have my own freshman in my house and all of his friends and watching what they're going through. It It is not what we all had for those of us who had the traditional freshman year experience. They have given up a lot. Their whole senior year of high school was disrupted and and how they onboard into college is disrupted, the formation of their relationships with each other, with the faculty and staff, how they engage in the campus community, you know, the memories, all of that is really disrupted. And and they, along with a lot of other people, are suffering because of that. Um, but they're also incredibly resilient, we're seeing. They are uh, this is how I think of it, and I know that this, I sound a little bit more like that mom than I do like the president of the University of Minnesota, but these kids were all, and I shouldn't call them kids, they're adults now, these young adults were born in the shadow of 9-11 um, from that exact era of time. I was nine months pregnant when 9-11 happened. They came of age in late elementary school and middle school during the bubble bursting in the worst of the recession, and they graduated from high school or started college now. So I believe that they are gritty and resilient and that what we will see from them as they reach adulthood and take on leadership positions is a next great generation because they've endured a lot and everything that they thought they could count on shifted in front of them and they endured and pursued and persisted anyway. So there. Boy, when you put it like that, President Gable, boy, we really had it easy. It's a little <laughs> grand compared to this generation. Say it that way, but it's true. Wow. It's, they've really been through a lot, and I think that they will uh, lead us well as they reach adulthood. Yeah, well, that is very inspirational. I mean, and you know, I'm glad you gave us that perspective because I have really been feeling for the college freshman who I know, who went to the University of Minnesota, who went to Boston College, which was my undergrad, and what a freshman year I remember. It was one of the best years ever, but you've really painted a picture of this resiliency, and they're going to go on to be the leaders of the future. They're already leading in some cases, and uh, they've really, you know, they can have that go-getter attitude. Nothing can really get them down. I, th I think so. I think so, too. I, that's what I'm seeing. Well, thank you. As always, President Joan Gable, a pleasure to have you on. We hope you come back and visit anytime and uh, have a wonderful holiday season and have fun with your college students, too. Thanks, Rashini. Same to you and yours. Thanks for having me. All righty.